Hello, and welcome to our MJ Biz LinkedIn Live. Today, we're covering recent innovations in cannabis and psychedelic science with featured guests from the Emerald Conference by MJ Biz Science. Today's topics will cover product development uh, using minor cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids, enhancing microbial and virus remediation on cannabis cultivars, and establishing analytical testing methods for psychoactive plant medicines. The Emerald Conference takes place at the Lowe's Coronado Res Bay Resort in San Diego on April 1st to 3rd. And there's no better way to be at the forefront of cannabis and psychedelic science with researchers and product innovators who are making a remarkable difference in moving plant science and medicine forward. Stick with us to the end and we'll drop a promo code for 10% savings on your conference registration. We will also drop a link to subscribe to our MJ Biz Science newsletter with updates on the latest in plant science. Please be sure to drop any questions in the chat. We will reserve time at the end of today's presentation for Q&A. Now I'd like to introduce today's moderator. Wes Burke is the founder and CEO of Emerald Scientific. He's been instrumental in the foundation of the Emerald Conference and the enhancement of the advancement of cannabis and psychedelics research. Welcome, Wes. Hi, thanks, Kelly, for the introduction. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm excited to be here today, um, getting started even a little early, so that's great. Um, we've got a lot of really interesting information to chat with you today, and I think the discussion is going to be very interesting. Before we get started, I would like to uh, tease a new peer-reviewed peer journal that is going to be called the Cannabis and Psychedelic Science Journal. This will formally be introduced at the Emerald Conference um, coming up, as Kelly mentioned, the first part of April. So we're very excited about the journal and we think it's going to be a, a big influence in helping advance uh, sciences in both cannabis and psychedelics. If before the Emerald Conference, you believe that you've got content that might be appropriate for the journal, feel free to reach out to me directly at Wes, W-E-S, at emeraldscience.com. Without further ado, I'm going to start today by introducing Jake Magellan. He's a professor in the Department of Biochemistry at McMaster University in Canada. He grew up in Canada and has a PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Western Ontario on the subject of chemical synthesis of natural molecules. From 2010 to 2017, he was a professor in the chemistry department at the University of Idaho. In 2017, he was repatriated to Canada by McMaster University where he now holds the Boris Family Chair of Drug Discovery at the university. Dr. Magdalene's research includes a wide range of interdisciplinary biomedical research, where his lab is the chemistry part of the chemistry biology collaborations focused on drug discovery. His lab also does some fundamental organic chemistry focused projects. And for several years, Jake and his research team have been interested in the chemistry and biology of rare minor cannabinoids. They've been innovating in the area of unique chemistry technologies that can help produce minor cannabinoids in high purity. Jake also enjoys speaking about chemistry to non-scientific audiences, as exemplified by his popular TED Talk that is titled, A Crash Course in Organic, in Organic Chemistry. So thanks for being here, Jake. To get us started today, I'd like to just ask you, as an organic chemist, what would what would you say you think about cannabis and cannabinoids differently from how a non-chemist might think about these compounds? Uh, well, thank you for the question, Wes, and for the kind introduction. Um, sure, yeah, I think there are um, uh, some differences between the way I think of this space and perhaps uh, non-chemists and non-scientists. Uh, they they probably concern uh, you know the concept of pure molecules versus mixtures. Uh, and, you know, the strength of evidence when it comes to health claims. So let me just address the first one, the issue of purity. So I think chemists tend to have a bit of a visual sense of what a molecule like THC or CBD actually is. Uh, they're little molecular machines, right? They're assembled 
um, in the plant by enzymes, which are larger machines with blueprints for those enzymes encoded in genes in the biosynthetic gene clusters. So the plant is like, um, I think of the plant as a factory, right? It's building a lot of molecules, a uh, whole menu, they, they all get mixed together in each plant within a strain even, certainly each strain can have a slightly different mixture. I come at this space from the perspective of uh, rigorous you know, medical research. And in that world, these complex mixtures are a non-starter, right? Um, and, and for very good reason, you know, and the reason is simply that usually you can't get reproducible data from one day to the next uh, if you don't know exactly what you're testing. Uh, so from my perspective, the objective here um, is to understand very well what each unique cannabinoid does, um, including all the miners, right? And then also look for synergies and combinations, but you do that in a really well-controlled way um, so that the data is reproducible, can be trusted. I think a lot of skilled labor in my world, uh, skilled scientific labor goes into just getting our hands on pure minor cannabinoids, being certain of their identity and purity um, before we start testing them in biology. So I, I, I don't want to speak for you know, other people, Wes, but I have a sense that much of the non-scientific community is less concerned or comfortable with less purity, right? Uh, and also perhaps less rigorous evidence behind health claims than, than I would be, uh, mm -hmm. which is not to say that I'm not optimistic about this space. I think there's a lot of really good hypotheses, many unanswered questions. I like unanswered questions. You know, I think the average person probably wants answers. It might not be healthy to get excited about, you know, uh, mysteries, but that's, you know, that's what a scientific education does. Um, and you know, I think everyone is on the same page in the sense that we all want to know the truth about these compounds. We all want to consume healthy food and medicine. So we're all on the same team. Yeah. I think um, you know, most scientists, many scientists could do a, a better job of being good teammates in this world, right? Of communicating more often with the general public uh, more effectively. It's a long-winded answer to your question, Wes. Yeah. No, I think it's a great answer, Jake. And and I I do believe that. Um, the consumer is is getting more and more interested in the answers to some of these questions, and I think it's fundamental to to having a solid foundation for this industry to grow upon is 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 really exploring and, and answering these questions about these compounds. Uh, maybe before we proceed, you might be willing to kind of give us a, a quick and painless organic chemistry lesson to help us understand a bit more about the structures of minor cannabinoids, cannabinoids. And uh, I, I think you're probably expert on that. Yeah, Wes, I, I won't lie. I was I was prepared for that question, and I would love to share a few slides with you get, with this audience to see whether I can teach uh, the basics of this chemistry to everybody. Um, I promise you, it'll be quick. So here are the acronyms for the twelve most patented compounds. We're all familiar with the top two CBD and THC, and the others are, I think, to most people, justifiably are just acronyms without much meaning. And if I was to show you the, the chemical structures mm -hmm. of all of these, um, frankly, that doesn't help much you know, to the average person. You see these structures on a Wikipedia article, but, but unless you're trained in interpreting them, it's hard to make sense of them. And I'm gonna try to help with that, okay? So this is another representation of CBD. These little spheres are carbon atoms, oxygen atoms, and hydrogen atoms. And uh, you can perhaps kind of look at the side-by-side -side images and see the similarity. But, but to help, we remove the hydrogens and then we, I like to split cannabinoids into these three components that I, I call face, core, and tail, and then number the carbon atoms. So on the, on the right-hand structure, it's the, the edges, like the corners of the bonds that get numbers and they represent carbon atoms. So there's 10 carbon atoms in the face, uh, six in the core and five in the tail. And the 10 in the face is, cons is consistent for all uh, cannabinoids. Uh, and you can see that if you compare different ones. So here's CBD and THC. Uh, now, I mean, if you're a chemist looking at this, you see, just like you can see on this slide, that the cores are ident almost identical, the tails are identical, and the face is, is where this changed. There's a, a bond, a atomic bond between carbon eight, the carbon I've labeled as eight, and, uh, and the oxygen atom. And here's three others. Here's CBG, cannabigerol. It's just, it has an, like an open chain without that six-membered ring. Uh, CBC has a different ring structure. And CBN um, looks a lot like THC. 
but it has two more of those, what we refer to as double bonds. Um, so this is the, the nice part of the lesson. And I like to say that if you want to understand all of the cannabinoids, you can do it all almost in one slide because there are really just a limited number of faces, cores, and tails that are common. So if you split it up this way, um, there really are just these 10 most common faces, just two cores, and they only differ in one little way. And the letter A represents the bottom one if it's an acid. And that sphere there is the carboxylic acid, we call it. And then there's a, you know every possible tail length from one to seven, but most of them are very rare. And some of them are, have not even been you know, found yet in the plant, but we expect them to be there. The most common ones are five carbons and three carbons. So now if you talk about what the acronyms mean, the, the first three letters are always describing the face. So delta nine THC is, is a face. And then if you change the tail length, you add a letter to represent that. That's THCV, means the tail length is shorter. And if you add a carboxylic acid, you add a letter to represent that. And it's the same nomenclature with all the faces. So with CBD, if you can recognize the face of it, then you know that CBDV is just a shorter tail. Uh, CBD, you know, C1 or C2 would be the one carbon or two carbon tails, CBDA. And if you do both, if you change the tail length and add the acid, then you incorporate both letters into the name. Um, and that's it. And so in my lab, uh, my team and I here, we're trying to be really comprehensive and quite literally make all of these and have them all in high purity in large amounts and make them available to researchers who are interested in studying them independently. Uh, so these are the two famous ones and the next 10 that appear most often in uh, patents, so they're most industrially relevant, uh, and there are many others, right? Um, but they can be systematically organized kind of in this way, based on their faces and their cores, the two cores and their various tails. And, uh, and the last slide I have that I want to share with you is that knowing what I've just taught you, you can very quickly look at the structure of something that is not produced by the plant, that's commonly referred to as a synthetic cannabinoid, and you can recognize that it just doesn't fit the architecture. So Nabilone, for example, is entirely a pharmaceutical design. Uh, it's an FDA approved drug um, and it is based on THC, but it's got features that don't appear in the plant. It's, it's even more potent at, at binding the cannabinoid receptors. And then you have some molecules that don't look remotely like the natural cannabinoids, but they also happen to hit the same receptors. They're uh, There are many of these and they're referred to as synthetic cannabinoids. And I, as a synthetic chemist, I think this distinction is very important because if CBD is made by a chemist, it's still a phytocannabinoid, um, even though it's made not by a plant, but by a chemist. Uh, that's the terminology we use. The term synthetic means it's not one of the natural ones. Uh, I hope that makes sense, Wes, and, and, I, and I hope that wasn't too much organic chemistry uh, for this crowd. No, I'm a, I'm a good test case because I am not a chemist and I tracked everything you said. In fact, I thought it was quite interesting. So thanks for taking the time to do that. But I, I'm kind of curious with all of the different compounds out there that, that your lab could have studied, um, why did you first become involved in cannabinoid research? Um, yeah, that's, great. that's a great question. Canada legalized, you know, a few years back and um, made research easier. McMaster University, where I work up in Hamilton in Canada has a, almost a university-wide research license to store biomass and to store pure cannabinoids. And um, the our interest was actually initiated by a colleague. His name is Professor Eric Brown. He discovers antibiotics, and he became interested in testing as many cannabinoids as he could get his hands on for their ability to, to kill or inhibit the growth of these uh, disease-causing bacteria. And he found that a few of them are pretty good antibiotics. You know, he has a, a hypothesis that perhaps that is why the plant is making some of these compounds uh, to protect itself uh, from infection. Uh, and the, the compound CBG or cannabigerol was particularly potent. And Eric, uh, Professor Brown, wanted to get more of it, much more of it than he had in order to test it in a mouse model of infection. And uh, it was expensive. And he asked me if we could to make it in our lab. And so uh, that's when I became interested in how to make CBG. Uh, we were able to make it for him and, and you know, publish an academic paper about 
its antibiotic activity. And then the chemists in my group uh, became interested in you know, the process of making it and trying to improve it. The published literature for how to, for how to make it was really inefficient. And we stumbled on some, some kind of innovation to make it better. Um, and we've since really run with that so, to the point where we, we can now make you know, a kilo of some of these cannabinoids, including CBG, in high purity. Uh, so we're, we're trying to compete with the plant, in a sense. And for some cannabinoids, um, they're really, really difficult to get in bulk from the plant. Uh, and chemical synthesis is just a, a, a tool that can access them. Sure. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Well, what what can we expect uh, in in terms of what the research is going to uh, unveil in the coming years, and and how is your lab innovating in the space? Yeah. Well, I mean, in a nutshell, uh, Wes, that's what the topic of my talk in San Diego uh, will be about. Um, uh, the company GW Pharma did a lot of preclinical research in this space on minors, and they filed a bunch of patents. They're now owned by Jazz. And, uh, you know, they listed some potential uses of selected minor cannabinoids, but there are so many questions uh, to answer. And in San Diego, I'll kind of summarize that. Some of the recent evidence that suggests, for example, THCV has some cardiometabolic benefits. CBN might have some beneficial neurological activity. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, and as far as what my lab is doing, you know, we're doing the chemistry side of that. We're developing tools to make these compounds available to researchers in bulk quantities. And we're giving them away to other academics across Canada. Um, this is not a, you know, this, this part of the research, the early stage biomedical side is not a business. It's an academic exercise. Um, and uh, we love to be able to, you know, contribute to supporting that research. Um, and I'll share some of the specifics of our chemistry uh, in San Diego. That's great, Jacob. I really look forward to it. I look forward to seeing you down there. Thanks for your time today. I'm going to move on to the next panelist now. So Dr. Tassa Saldi is an accomplished molecular biologist with more than 25 years of research experience in RNA biology, infectious disease, and molecular pathogen detection. Dr. Saldi graduated Kuma Samlaude with a degree in molecular biology. She completed her graduate and postdoctoral studies at the University of Colorado, Go Buffs, my alma mater as well, where she studied RNA structure, small RNAs, and RNA processing. She was awarded a prestigious fellowship from the American Cancer Society and, one, and was one of the 18 doctoral fellows nationwide invited to present her research at the Aspen Cancer Conference. She's off, authored more than 20 peer-reviewed articles in top-tier journals. As the chief executive of, officer and co-founder of Tumi Gen Genomics, Dr. Saldi continues to use her expertise to provide the cannabis industry with reliable, accurate diagnostic tools and pathogen mitigation guidance. So thanks for being here with us today. Um, seems like the obvious place to start might be a brief over, overview of the hop latent viroid. Um, seems to be a, a hot topic in the cannabis space, and maybe you can help us understand why it matters to the industry. Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you very much for that um, introduction, Wes. Um, so hop latent viroid. Um, hop latent viroid is a pathogenic infection. It is um, specific to plants, so it's not something that a mammal could contract. And um, hop latent viroid specifically has a fairly narrow host range. Um, it infects cannabis, hops, where it was originally identified, and stinging nettle. Um, so viroids themselves are literally the simplest form of life, if you can even call them life, that exists on planet Earth. Um, what viroids have basically done is taken all the complexity of life and boiled it down to information, basically just the sequence of letters that tell the organism how to do what it's supposed to do. So as opposed to other forms of life that have kind of an outside protection to sort of keep that information safe, viroids lack that protection. And this is an important concept for cultivators to understand because there's a lots of disinfectants like alcohol, soap, quaternary ammonia that target the fats and proteins that are in that protective layer. And since viroids don't have the layer, those things are completely ineffective. Um, 
So the reason this thing is so important for cultivators to understand and to mitigate is that it is an incredibly expensive infection. Um, among all of its, you know, rather unpleasant symptoms like stunting and slow growth and poor rooting, probably the worst symptom of all for hop latent thyroid is a dramatic reduction in flower size and THC CBD content, which makes this thing really expensive um, for a cultivator. And it is everywhere. Um, we've detected it all across the United States. We've detected it in Canada, Asia, Africa, Europe. It's basically a global pandemic. Um, and it's really common. I think somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of the facilities either have hop latent viroid that test with us or have had it in the past. Um, and most of them that have an issue, the number of positive plants is like 25 to 30 percent. So, um, this is kind of a, an every cultivator problem at this point, and it's something that everybody needs to be thinking about when it comes to um, SOPs or strategies to mitigate its economic impact on your operation. Sure, the economic uh, impact is is staggering, and I've, I've heard some hor horror stories, certainly along those lines, but yes, kind of tell us about the purpose of, of your research and what you're hoping to accomplish with what you're doing. Yes. Yeah. So those strategies that I just mentioned is exactly what we are trying to develop um, through a research collaboration between Tumi Genomics, um, State House Holdings, and a company called Spec AI that does artificial intelligence um, spectrometry kind of studies. Um, so basically what we're trying to do is to develop data-driven yet realistic and logistically possible solutions for growers um, to give them guidelines on how to mitigate hop latent thyroid. Um, I think probably one of the biggest disconnects right now is that there's a ton of things that people recommend, uh, scientists would recommend that growers do best practices, but some of those best practices may not fit logistically and economically into an operation. So our goal is to sort of understand hop latent thyroid on a very basic um, level so that we can give growers recommendations that are economically viable and logistically possible. Um, so the things that we are trying to understand, and hopefully I'm gonna be able to present on a lot of this at Emerald Conference, and I think it's gonna be really exciting, but um, understanding resistance in cannabis plants. Does resistance exist? What types of resistances exist? Um, and what does that even mean? You know, Is it resistance? Is it tolerance? Do all of these things exist in cannabis? Um, and we've got some really cool data showing uh, different strains and how different strains respond to hop latent viroid. Um, we're also going to talk about the meaning of viroid load or how much viroid is in a plant and what that means to a cultivator if they get a plant with a high load or a low load. What are they supposed to do with that information? Um, and then one of the pieces of information that I think is going to be incredibly valuable is um, we tracked the infection over time throughout um, 12 different strains, and then we correlated levels and positivity or negativity in each different strain to the outcome. And so what we're developing are guidelines as to what is the perfect stage or the most um, predictive stage to test for hop latent thyroid that could tell you, well, okay, if you have a, a positive that is a high level at this growth stage, just get rid of it because it's going to be a dud and you're going to waste money on that. Um, and so all of this is to just try to develop SOPs for people so that um, they have an arsenal of tools that are based on data that they can use to give them the best possible outcomes um, economically for their operations. Interesting. Well, and I, I don't want to ask you to give away your whole presentation from the Emerald Conference, but you've you've mentioned mitigation a couple times here. So what else can you say about mitigation? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. So I think uh, probably the biggest, most important concept when it comes to mitigation is that prevention is a thousand times cheaper and more effective than remediation, okay? So there are a ton of different things that growers can do to protect themselves, to keep this thing from entering their facility or spreading in their facility. Um, some of the measures that um, are most important, I can go over just really, really briefly. 
Um, we've actually come up with a, an acronym called STOP that spells out some of the, the basic things that a grower can do to protect themselves. And this works for whether we're talking about haploid and viroid or we're talking about other pathogens, which can also be incredibly damaging like fusarium. Um, the basic idea here, S for STOP, is to sterilize. So basically, you know, keep your facility clean. Um, especially for viroids, 10% bleach, which I know, I think someone told me I'm become the bleach lady or something like that, but that's cool with me. As long as that helps people remember, that's incredibly effective. Um, you know, when you just keep pots clean, floors clean, pick up garbage, you know, wear gloves, you need to protect your plants from your street clothes, things like that. Um, T is for testing. It is absolutely essential to test. You cannot always tell if the virus is present in your facility. Um, and if you don't know about it, that's not going to stop it from causing economic damage. Um, and and um, that's part of what we're doing with State House is coming up with the best practice schedules based on data. Um, the O is for organization, organize the flow of traffic and kind of organize what you're going to do if you find hop latent virus in your facility. Um, because it's really important to have a mitigation plan so you can act on it quickly if, if you discover something is there. Um, and then the P is to protect yourself, all right? The single most common way that any pathogen is going to get into your facility, especially for an indoor cannabis cultivator, is to bring in infected material. So if you bring something in, test it. Do not put it next to your most valuable cultivars right away unless you know that it's pathogen free. Um, it is absolutely worth spending 25 or 40 or whatever the test costs to know that you're not bringing in something that could kill an entire room of plants left unchecked. Yeah, good. That's a that's a great acronym, easy to remember. And um, that's yeah, that's good stuff. Is your research indicating that there's actually is resistance possible for different cultivars or resistance levels? Does it vary for different cultivars? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I won't give away all the data, but um, it's looking really exciting that we're we're actually finding different categories of um, response to hop latent viroid. We see some plants that are incredibly sensitive um, that, you know, they catch the infection easily. They build up a high load and it completely tanks, you know, their yield. Um, we also see plants where they seem resistant, which means that it's difficult to infect them. They don't build up a load very highly and the effect on the final product is minimal. Um, and then what's really interesting is we're also finding a category of plants that are tolerant, um, which means they, they get infected like falling off a log, they build up this massive load of viroid and then the, the product is fine. Um, and it's, it's really cool because we're actually building somewhat of a protocol of sorts where um, growers can discover which of their strains fall into which of these different categories in their facility. And then they can use that information to decide which strains they want to grow, which strains they want to shelf. And, you know, maybe they can even grow all the tolerant ones together, all the resistant ones together, sensitive ones together, and, and kind of organize that as a, as a method of mitigation as well. That's interesting because I would have just assumed that viral load was really critical in terms of, you know, whether the plant was go going to really be damaged and suffer lack of productivity or, um, but I'm hearing you say that that's not necessarily the case. It isn't. Yeah. And so we, it's really interesting. We see, um, if you step back and look at all the data and aggregate, there is a correlation between load and symptoms, but on a plant per plant basis or for specific strains, um, there's not a great correlation. And um, it's really fascinating because even these small genetic changes that you have between different cultivars can dramatically impact how that plant responds to hop latent viroid. Um, and I would venture a guess, you know, and, and this is just based on what's known out there about other viroids, this has a lot to do with the specific immune system and that it's um, the immune system is actually targeting specific sequences and those sequences differ between cultivars. And so, um, yeah, I think a, it would be incredibly fascinating to, to dive into that and understand why some plants can exist with this infection and not care. Some plants it, it, it won't infect or it won't travel through the plant or it won't grow the viroid load. And then other plants, they just, you know, they just fall over and, and look terrible. So um, it's really interesting from a molecular biology perspective. It is interesting. Well, 
I, again, look forward to your presentation in San Diego. Can't wait to see you down there. And thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. Yes, I'm absolutely. Gonna, yeah, I'm going to move on to Christopher. Um, Christopher Polly is one of the leaders and co-founders of Tripto Triptomics. Um, his past accomplishments in molecular biology speak for themselves. With a wealth of experience in genomic and transcriptomic analysis, as well as assay development for numerous psychoactive plants and fungi, Christopher's long been recognized as a trailblazer in the industry. One of his most notable contributions has been his groundbreaking work in developing marker-assisted breeding systems, which have enabled breeders to create custom chemical profiles to produce desired medicinal or recreational effects in cannabis sativa. His outstanding research in secondary metabolite profile prediction and pathogen detection assays has earned him recognition as the lead inventor for three utility patents focused on genetic mar on genetic markers he designed and brought into the laboratory testing space. His expertise in both cannabis and fungi have also been instrumental in his development of an intellectual property strategy that has protected, licensed, and further developed technologies related to various aspects of genetic classification and breeding selection. Thanks for being here with us today, Christopher. You want to tell us a little bit about how testing labs help reduce harm and provide consumers with informed consent, please. Yeah, thank you, Wes, and I uh, appreciate the introduction. And um, yeah, so really kind of we came about the idea of testing natural products because we come from testing cannabis and we all come from that space where we've, you know, been given a bag of marijuana and said, you know, this is marijuana without any strain potency, understanding of what chemistry is there. And as our progression has under, uh, as our understanding has progressed over the years, we've kind of realized this chemistry is vastly different between the different cultivars. And we really see that same case in all natural products. And so when it comes to mushrooms, like psychedelic mushrooms in particular, or Amanita mushrooms, um, dosing is one of the most important things because there's this fine line from slightly intoxicating to fully intoxicating are very impairing to your ability to do things throughout your day. Um, and so what we've been able to do in the last two years is kind of study what diversity is out there and what, what do we normally see when people say, oh, I ate a gram of mushrooms. What does that actually mean? And from some of the data that we've seen, um, sorry about that, uh, it can mean as little as one milligram of psilocybin per gram of mushrooms as like a 0.1% mushroom up to 40 milligrams of psilocybin for that uh, one gram sample of mushroom. And so with that kind of dosing variability, it's like saying, you know, all cannabis is the same and somebody's selling you hemp and somebody's selling you a 30% THC strain. And it's like, yeah, these have about the same effect. And so we really see that as, you know, you should have that information before you consent to try that cannabis or that mushroom. Um, and that's something we really um, see as a harm reduction strategy, and we operate under decriminalization rules um, as a harm reduction testing lab. And so we kind of see how that can progress into all the different natural products that Colorado has legalized, as well as, um, you know, other plant medicines that we use throughout our day. This variation in potency is, I mean, a similar story in cannabis, but is is this variation that you're seeing with fungi, is it even even greater? Definitely. I, the greater kind of debate is a tough one. Um, I would say it's definitely more impactful. Um, for example, you know, psilocybin causes these hallucinations, um, whereas, you know, you're 20 to 30 percent cannabis, you might not even notice the difference because of the entourage effect compounds. Um, whereas, you know, a half percent mushroom or a two percent mushroom, you're very much going to notice the difference of that. And that's going to affect kind of what you're able to do on that that dosing. Um, also in Amanita, it becomes one of the issues of potentially having negative side effects with the dosing is too much. Um, some people have that same experience in cannabis, but I think in Amanita mushrooms and a lot of these other natural products, it's kind of a more across the board, everybody has a bad time if they overdo it. Um, and so being able to understand that variation that exists out there 
um, is just one step in this puzzle of being able to effectively use these natural medicines and kind of personalize them for us um, as consumers. Yeah, that's a great point, Christopher. Tell us about um, how genetics fit into the testing models. Yeah, so that's um, kind of my jam. I love the genetic analysis and genetic testing that we can do. And it's interesting to see in cannabis, it's kind of taken a while for genetic testing to come online and people to trust in the process that they can select for traits um, in a seedling. In fungi, it seems that most people are using genetics. This is how we can identify the different species of fungi. So if we have, you know, over 200 species of mushrooms produce psilocybin, um, how do you tell them apart from each other, especially when they can potentially look quite similar to each other? So genetic testing is a great role. Um, currently in Oregon, it's being used as a speciation test, as well as microbial testing and pathogen testing. So being able to see if there's potentially some harmful black mold or other contaminant that was growing in the same space that your mushrooms were growing. Genetic testing is the way that we really can figure that out. And to kind of farther the point, I, I really see a future where we're using genetics to select and create these cultivars that we want. So as we understand potentially more of norbeocysteine or baocysteine is something that we want, we can have genetic markers that allow us to select for that and be able to control kind of those chemical profiles that we're observing through our chemistry currently. Interesting. Um, how do you expect mushrooms and, and potentially other natural products to be treated in terms of laboratory testing? Is it going to be quite like the the cannabis path that has, has been kind of trailblazed thus far, or do you expect it to be substantially different? Yeah, so that that's an interesting point for sure, because kind of when we think back to why we started testing cannabis originally, we really had this focus on medical patients. And so medical patients were at the central of it. And originally it was cancer patients, AIDS patients, people with a compromised immune system or needing a very clean product for them to consume. And mushrooms were seeing more of mental health being the kind of main focus of the uh, use of psychedelics. And so that's one of the things that we kind of will see, I think a shift in less testing potentially. Um, but also different types of testing, because what we're seeing here is a fungi um, that has, you know, potentially different pathogens, different uh, contaminants, and different dangers of those contaminants. You know, when we bread with mold on it, that can be acceptable sometimes. But if you were to smoke that bread, it might not be. Without kind of the method of ingestion of smoking, we can think about testing slightly differently here in terms of what is actually important. Um, but we do see the states kind of rolling out rules that are pretty much mimicking cannabis. It's something that we've already figured out with that path being led by cannabis. The easiest way to go about setting up a testing regimen for a state is to follow what cannabis did, say the same things are important. Um, we're seeing a lot of focus on psilocybin and psilocin, similar to the back in the day when we saw the main focus on THC and CBD. We can now know from Jacob's research and all of the different groups that are studying these minor cannabinoids that some of them have, you know, potentially more drastic effects on your actual outcome of you using that rather than, you know, just understanding the THC number as the main thing. And so kind of one thing I always promote in these state board meetings and different things that we get to be involved in and in making the laws in Colorado is to push for that extra testing of understanding what are these entourage compounds right off the bat. Um, we know, similar to cannabis, there's different subspecies of mushrooms. So when we talk about Psilocybe cubensis, that's kind of the most common psychedelic mushroom that most people uh, would ingest. That one has, you know, maybe at least 100 different subspecies, and it seems like people are doing crosses, coming out with new ones every day. And so it's kind of that game of cannabis where we're hybridizing, we're making it more potent, better, different. Um, but a lot of times, if you're only focused on the one active ingredient, you're losing a lot of that diversity that's actually there. And so kind of I think there'll be a, a dual role here of testing, not only to give you that informed consent, but also to preserve the genetic diversity that's out there already that we know exists because we're studying the land races right now with this advanced technology and testing capabilities. That's interesting. So I'm I'm curious, there's, you know, you talking about the difference in in what needs to be looked at with cannabis and and mushrooms in particular um I, i'm assuming that if there's some extraction technologies that are being implemented that may may include solvents so probably a solvent regime is appropriate for 
mushroom testing, at least finished product. Um, what about pesticides and metals? Are, are, do those need to be looked at in, in fungi the same way that we need to look at those in cannabis? Yeah, so I would say it's um, a little bit different with the pesticides because you don't see a lot of people applying pesticides to their mushroom grows. That's just not a thing that most people do. Um, but we look at where do the mushrooms come from? What are they growing on? And a lot of times that's cocoa core um, or, you know, a manure type substrate. And that could be riddled with pesticides. You know, what the cow was eating in the farm before it produced this manure could have potential residual pesticides in it that'll be, you know, bioaccumulated by the mushroom. In the same case with heavy metals, when we think about cocoa core, that's usually what the states are kind of leaning towards because it's this idea of, hey, it's cleaner. This isn't, you know, as variable as manure is. So this is the better way to go about it. Um, but where do a lot of coconut trees grow? Where are they getting this coconut uh, core from? It might be riddled with heavy metals. It might be next to a factory that's producing a lot of toxins into the environment and that's getting taken up in the cocoa core tree or in the coconut tree. Um, and then subsequently in the cocoa core that's processed out of it. And so when we think about kind of those type of questions, I think it's something that we really have to, um, I've heard the idea of screening randomly, that it's not something you have to test every batch for. I would argue against that on the sense that you don't know what batch of coconut core this was grown with. Sure, if the last batch passed, you would think this supplier is producing a high quality coconut core that doesn't have heavy metals, um, but maybe they get to a new part of their coconut forest and it does have heavy metals. And so that's one thing we see with these natural products, especially natural products growing from other natural products, is that you have to really chase down that chain to figure out where are these things coming from. And that I do see a lot of the same testing being implemented just because it's a lot of the same inputs that you're using the same kind of additives, um, nutrients, substrates, whether your grain was grown organically or not can make a huge difference as well. Um, rye berries are not put to the same scrutiny as cannabis is these days. So, you know, the bread that you get in the grocery store can have a ton of pesticides sprayed on that grain that went in to make that bread. Um, mushroom growers take that rye berry and sterilize it and use that for their process, but you don't necessarily, when you sterilize it, remove those heavy metals or pesticides or other uh, potential contaminant compounds that would come along with the rye berry. Very interesting. Yeah. So I think we've got um, about 15 minutes left. If anybody would like to, to ask any of these panelists any questions, now'd be a great time to submit them. And while we kind of wait and see what comes in uh, and, and before we navigate those, I just want to take a minute to um, I, I'm going to just say a few words about the Emerald Conference and then Jacob, Christopher and Tass, I'll give you all a chance as, as well to, to kind of plug the Emerald Conference. I mean, obviously, we're excited to see your full presentations there. Um, as Kelly mentioned in the beginning, I am the, the founder of the Emerald Conference co-founder. And we started this conference back in uh, 2014 because we quickly learned as we entered the space that um, there was not really a great platform for high science and collaboration. There was a big desire for the real scientists in the cannabis industry to collaborate, and there simply wasn't a good venue for it. Some of the other really good um, conferences out there and such were just not focused on on the science and we saw that appetite and we put the Emerald Conference together specifically to be a venue for that kind of collaboration. I'm very proud of what the conference has become and very excited uh, about what MJ Biz is doing with it now. Um, and I just, uh, I think it, it remains the most sophisticated conference relative to the cutting edge science in the cannabis and now psychedelic space. So I would encourage all the all the listeners, if you've not already bought your tickets, um, I really encourage you to do it. It's a fantastic place, not only to, to learn, but as I said, to network and collaborate. And um, the list of collaborations that have come out of the Emerald Conference are uh, a mile long. I could go on and on about some of the great work that has come through collaborations that were initiated at the Emerald Conference. Um, Jacob, would you like to share anything on, on that subject? And uh, Wes, let me just say, I've attended one previously, and and uh, I, I had a really uh, great time, and I learned a lot. Also, a student from my lab attended last year. 
uh, presented a, a, a poster. It was well received. So I'm thrilled to have a chance to go back and, and speak on that stage. It's a great venue, um, really bright people. And I agree with you. It's a good space to, to collaborate uh, kind of with uh, people of goodwill generally. Yeah, not not a bad place to spend a little time in early April either. It's a nice beach across the street, yeah. Yeah. Tassa, anything from you? Um, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm this is my first Emerald Conference. I'm very excited. But um, I think that um, conferences like these are incredibly important um, because the amount of research that currently exists in cannabis is so much smaller than in other agricultural spaces. And having a forum where you can bring in, you know, industry and academia together and have a meeting of minds there so that you can form collaborations that can find really fascinating, you know, academic discoveries that can be quickly translated into products or solutions for cultivators um, so that we can we can help this industry as quickly as possible catch up with the rest of agriculture. And I think it's phenomenal that there's a forum for this. And I'm incredibly excited to meet all of the other academics and industry leaders that are working in this space and um, see what kind of great data we can share and, and ideas that we can come up with. So I'm I'm very excited and excited about the beach also. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. All right. Well, I can't wait to see you there. Christopher? Yeah, so I've been to the Emerald Conference uh, one year previous to this and had an amazing time, have met so many amazing people and kind of expanded my mind of what research is even going on in cannabis. That's always an issue when we're so hyper-focused in our own area of expertise. You don't really get a chance to go look around and say, oh, what are you doing as well? Um, and so beyond the you know academic rigor of it and how in, um, informative it was, it's also a great networking event that we've had. I've made lifelong friends out of the Emerald Conference. Um, and I see kind of having all these pioneers of cannabis that have forged this path for how we handle natural products, kind of joining up with this new psychedelic space, really being um, a thought leadership space that we're able to really think about these things in an intuitive and kind of constructive way together to say, what is the right way to go about this going forward? Um, and so, yeah, I would 10 out of 10 recommend to definitely snag your ticket and um, I'd love to meet everybody that attends. That's great. Yeah, we look forward to seeing you there too. Okay, guys, we do have a few questions that have come in and Kelly is going to jump back on screen and and field those questions. So if uh, Jacob, Tassa and Christopher, if you guys want to all come on screen and have your mute button ready to toggle, then we'll let Kelly fire away at the questions that have come in through the um, through our guests. All right. Awesome. The first one comes from Luke and he's asking what your thoughts are on the mushroom starter kits that stores sell. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so yeah, there's, I mean, kind of a huge variation there. I think a lot of it comes from, you know, how much do you know about what you're getting? Um, and that's really where I think our testing panel will have a lot of information on that of what testing is available, what data is out there. Um, right now it, kind of felt like at first we were throwing a dart on the dartboard that you say it's this potency and it's like okay well is that more potent or less potent than the rest of them um that's something you know hopefully our panel will be able to show some of that data as well as kind of understand potentially some of these differences in substrate um conditions and understanding how that affects these secondary metabolite profiles um, so it's really something I think it's a great way to get into growing mushrooms and to be able to experience this for yourself. Um, I always like to do everything on my own and understand each piece of the process and see that I can ensure, you know, quality across the board there. Um, so that would be my recommendation on it. Awesome. Follow up to that is uh, somebody asked if the to analyze um, the dosage, do you blood test humans? to see the effects? Um, so we haven't, I don't believe have done that. I know in cannabis, um, some groups at CU, like the Hutchinson and uh, Bidwell labs have done some of these um, studies that they've done blood draws after a certain amount of consumption. Um, I don't believe that's been done in the psychedelic space. At least um, there's been a few, maybe out of John Hopkins that have now that I think about it. 
Um, us personally, we're mostly going on anecdotal evidence right now for kind of a dosing recommendation and just really showing you what's out there and then letting you say, okay, I tried one milligram or five milligrams. I know what this effect is. Um, and so you're kind of building that intoxication scale for yourself. Cause like we see in cannabis that, you know, when we say five nanograms per milliliter in your blood is the, you know, legal dose to drive in Colorado from the study at CU, it shows that's not really consistent. There's people that have a lot higher than that in their blood and aren't intoxicated and people who have lower in their blood and are intoxicated. And so it's kind of one of these questions of, you know, it's a very personal kind of subjective type answer of what is dosing and what dose is right for you. Um, but I think it really starts with nailing down what is the dose you're taking and being able to accurately do that and have multiple labs step up and say, we can test the same product and reproducibly come up with this result. And so that's about the stage we're at right now. And we'll have, I think, three different testing labs being on our panel that we're speaking for. Um, so it'll be a nice comparison to see kind of how we've worked together to be able to create that standardized testing that, you know, you get the accurate dose labeled at least. Wonderful. Uh, Tasa, this one's for you. How did the hop latent viroid infect so much of the cannabis plant stock? Um, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, what I, so nobody knows for sure the answer to this question. Um, what I suspect based on the, the sheer number of plants that are infected at this point is that um, the infection, which was originally characterized in hops like 1987, 1988, um, at some point was able to pop or jump over into cannabis. So a cross species jumped into cannabis. Um, but at the time that it did this cross species jump, cannabis was um, an illegal product, right? And so um, everybody was underground. They were exchanging clones and, and sending them around. And um, I think it kind of spread in a clandestine way because of the, the legalization or the lack thereof in cannabis. Um, and, you know, just because it's it's an incredibly common thing for people to exchange genetics or, hey, I got this thing from my buddy, um, you know, and, and even crossing the ocean with seeds and clones and all of this. And so it um, I think it spread very quickly because nobody knew it was there and nobody knew what was happening or that they should even be looking out for this. And by the time we knew what was happening, it had already spread like, globally, basically. Wow, thank you. Well, overall, I just want to thank everyone. Jake, I learned so much from your presentation that I've been wondering about for a long time. So I know that was valuable to everyone. And each of you just shared so many insights. So we appreciate that so much and can't wait for the full presentation at the Emerald Conference. To everybody out there, make sure you register by March 14th. That's when our pricing increases. So take advantage of those discounts, plus the one that Demi dropped in the chat here today. Um, any final words, Wes, before we sign off? No, I just, again, want to thank everybody for being here. I thought this was really informative, great discussion. And um, certainly, I, I'm, I believe you have compelled lots of folks to probably buy those tickets to the conference and get out there and collaborate with us. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again, and we'll see you in a month.